Hi everyone, welcome to the final SVG Europe Sound Talks 2021 with Inside Monitoring. Um, I hope you and your families are well. I'm Heather McLean, Editor and Head of Audio Communities at SVG Europe. Today we're focusing on the challenges of Atmos monitoring in small spaces and out into the wider topic of monitoring for next generation audio. So it should be a really, really interesting discussion. We've got a great lineup of speakers um, today. Uh, in our discussion on Atmos monitoring, we're going to hear from Aaron Hart, Sound Supervisor at Sky Sports, Neville Hooper, Deputy Head of Sound at NEP, Dolby Atmos Mixing Consultant, David Loudon, as well as our title sponsor, Telos Alliance, with Product Manager, Larry Shindell, plus Bernie Carpenter, Audio Product Manager at TSL Products, and Genelex R&D Director, Aki Makivirta. And not forgetting our wonderful chair, Roger Charlesworth, who's sporting a fantastic beard this time around. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Throughout the discussion, please post your questions for our speakers in the chat facility for Roger and our panellists to answer. They may be able to answer them during the discussion or otherwise um, you can unmute yourselves and ask the questions at the end. Um, and don't forget to keep yourselves on mute. OK, let's kick off. Over to you, Roger. Oh, great. Thanks, Heather. And thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Great to see you all. Um, the topic of of monitoring uh, is certainly been an interesting one as we've had sort of new challenges working with Atmos workflows, and um, and as we've changed as our our monitoring uh, scenarios have evolved, um, and we're worrying about monitoring more and more uh, different feeds and stuff like that. And I, I guess uh, a lot of our discussions will will be about Atmos because that's a, that's a big big challenge as we kind of gear up to do more and more. Um, Nev, I, I think I'll start with with you and and Aaron. It's sort of like this used to be a challenge and used to be a concern um, with uh, with Atmos monitoring and and it feels like now it's kind of become commonplace when you build a new truck or a new gallery, that that's, that's less of an issue than it was. Yeah, certainly we were in a very fortunate position, well, in some respects, um, that we built a um, four new trucks um, after a little incident that we had um, that kind of laid waste to some of our old trucks. And we were building new trucks and while at that point we were still only working in 5.1, we kind of had a sneaking suspicion that Atmos wasn't far away. So we were in the lucky position of building trucks from scratch and being able to factor it in. I mean, as a retrofit, it's a bit more of a challenge, particularly in trucks, we have a lot of confined spaces. I mean, certainly in, in our trucks that have Atmos monitoring, there's still only 150 mil in the roof cavity in which to mount a speaker, which can pre present a bit of a challenge. After a bit of research, certainly for the roof speakers, we settled on um, PMC product. Um, obviously, they've got a proven track record in monitoring. Um, and you know, while it would have been nice to have Genelec all around, because our, our other 5.1 speakers are all Genelex, um, you know, given the challenges, um, we had to go down that route. But actually, it worked well and, and, and they um, fit in well, and it, it's quite a nice tight space. So but yeah, if we'd have had to retrofit it, it would have been more of a challenge. So, um, you know, within the space, particularly given trucks where you have moving spaces that change size. And, you know, um, we initially had challenges when we first went 5.1 of where we were going to put the monitors. Thankfully, our, the size of our control rooms has increased and it's given us a bit more flexibility. But before you'd have to bolt it in the rack at the back of the room because that was as far back as you could go and it wasn't the ideal position. But it would work but you know as truck design has evolved and spaces have got bigger then you know we have a bit more flexibility about where they can go and this is kind of a standard thing now if you're building a new truck this is you're just gonna it's gonna be incorporated yeah, absolutely yeah unless we unless we're building a truck for a contract where we know specifically that it's not required for the for the minimal amount of effort to do it at build and install time compared to attempting to retrofit it, I think we would just, it would just be a given that we do it, um, you know, and, um, you know, even if it doesn't get used, I mean, you know, to be fair, there's there's certainly one truck that we built that has the facility, but it's never been used because it's never done an Atmos job. Yeah. 
but then it's ready when it is. Yes, exactly. Aaron, what do you think? Uh, this is sort of become for you guys it's sort of standard procedure for premier league and things like that um is this is this the issue that it was a few years ago in terms of complexity of monitoring monitoring for atmos yeah hi hi everyone um you know so production workflows for for us at sky sports means we have to create um several mixes in parallel we always have had to do that with 5.1 obviously with the added um expectations from atmos now in the uh, workflow so i try to play close attention to the atmos compared to the 5.1 uh, with the aim being to push the heights and therefore embellish that 5.1 plus four delivery as much as possible. Um, so the main challenges still are, you know, fold down consistency between Dolby E and Atmos CD2 jock, you know. So the ambient noise from the venues, uh, OB compounds, uh, outside broadcast trucks, um, and the added distractions of live talkback, which, you know, again, I'm going to refer to issues that always have been there and are still are. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll never go away wherever you produce the program from you know um being at the venue does bring many benefits you know um you could discuss with the crew where the optimum positions are for your mic placements um to capture the crowd and avoid the our southfield system or our we you know we're, we're, we're advocates of the southfield microphone because of the speed we have to rig venues and um push productions to where um, sometimes all in one day or in several hours, you know, Nev's, Nev's teams, my team combined, I've got an OB from the side of the truck coming out until, you know, we're rehearsing and we've got, you know, light sources coming into the desk and circuits in and out of the venue in several hours. And that's expected to be the norm these days. So speed and, you know, having a template to work to is, is what we've always kind of, what we've always tried to do. Um, but, you know, you could discuss things with the guys when you're on the ground, when you have the eyes and ears, like I say, um, for the optimum positions, you know, so those microphones aren't too close or too far away. So you can capture and just basically grab the best of what, what, you're, what you're facing. Um, obviously, I've, I've come from mixing live sports in an OB truck environment and Nev's trucks, the NEP 4K trucks, have really very good loudspeaker arrangements to give us the best chance to overcome some of those challenges that I've mentioned. Um, well, that's an interesting question, Aaron. You know, you've kind of, and we we kicked this around a little bit the other day, but uh, more production has moved away from the venue. And as you kind of move into a gallery situation rather than, than mixing at the venue, as you say, you lose some contact with the A2s at the site. Um, but I, I got to think that there's some great advantages too to being to being in a, a little bit larger control room and a little better controlled environment um yeah tell me tell us about that a little bit yeah absolutely i mean there's lots of challenges which i'll try not to sort of digress onto in terms of what remote productions um presented us as teams of uh, mixers supervisors uh, technical guys create you know facility providers um right the way through to delivering it to the customer but Remote productions are now the norm for many broadcasters. You know, we find ourselves on site less, or I certainly do. Um, I miss it in some ways. I won't go into specifics about what the pros and cons of it um, in terms of some of the things I miss and don't miss. But um, motorway you know, galleries, our galleries are uh, are quite a contrast compared to an OB truck. Um, they have uh, the next series of the Genelec ones, um, so. A step the next series on from what Nev put on board with exception to the heights which he alluded to earlier so you know they give us the best we've got the best tools in terms of that environment to 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 to, to you know to, to deliver um and I do have to honestly say it's far less fatiguing to mix in these more sanitized um, gallery environments um where the rims are much quieter um, so I would compliment the Genelet range in, in, in the NEP trucks and our galleries because the speaker characteristics give us really good center image and overall surround balance, um, particularly when we're off axis um, from the center mixing positions um, as you move around the desk in that sort of live broadcast mixing environment. Yeah. 
The uh, and you guys just uh, you guys got kind of recently sort of standardized too, which was a a lot of people use Gentle X, and you guys kind of standardized on Gentle X uh, recently, sort of just to establish that consistency, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there were some sort of guidelines from Dolby in terms of the heights. You know, the concept of the heights was 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 a big. Uh, a big change for everybody mixing in any environment, you know, how to sort of factor in that extra uh, force from above, really, you know, that what, what that's projecting into the room is, is does, does take a while to adjust to. Um, and it's a bit fast and furious in the live environment, you know, we try and be creative as we can, but having those extra height speakers, you know, um, sort of uh yeah it's 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 it, it was a challenge but um i think we're equipped pretty well with 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 the general x and there's consistency from the truck environment um we've taken what we've learned from producing them from from day one on on sykes we never launched atmos in a in a gallery environment we launched atmos in an ob environment on nev's trucks so you know with some with some pointers from dolby and that collective input about some attenuation in the ceiling you know, to sort of work within the environment that we are mixing in to sort of not over overcompensate or undercompensate what the mix is doing. And, you know, you trust your, your, your fold down parameters and everything else, which we'll probably come on to later. Well, yeah. And I think that something, um, something about live sports too, is you're kind of, you're setting up your mix and then to a certain degree, these ambiences just like the surround ambiences, the other ambiences, they have a sort of, they don't change. They may have dynamics to them, but they don't change. We're not flying spaceships around and stuff like that. So I think uh, I, I, my sense is that it it uh, is less critical. I hate to say that, but it's less critical. You got to get it tuned up right. But once you get it tuned up right, it kind of hopefully is more set it and forget it. Aki, what's the, you know, what are you, what are your considerations in sort of designing speaker systems for, for immersive and, and what sort of, what's sort of the most important factor when you're kind of putting these together? And it used to be sometimes in 5.1, particularly in a truck, somebody would just throw some random um surround speakers in um and i think we're getting a little bit more sophisticated can you can you talk a little bit about about sort of designing a speaker system for 514 yeah one of the one of the key aspects was already mentioned and that was the uh, that uh, the the different loudspeakers around your space deliver faithfully the same uh uh sound um color uh, and uh, co considering that in an immersive layout situation, you have this uh, kind of additional difficulty that uh, your loudspeakers, uh, first of all, they have to be located at the right orientation relative to your listening position so that, uh, so that you can fulfill the requirements of the production. When, once you do that, then you typically end up with challenges related to the, the room uh, uh, itself. Uh, because the loudspeakers are typically placed uh, in very different kind of positions. And so acoustically, they will inherently sound different at those positions. And uh, then it's a great benefit if you can easily measure and correct for those things and align your loudspeakers for level and delay so that you, uh, you kind of maximize your possibility of getting a proper presentation of what you're mixing. So from the point of view of designing the loudspeaker, then we want to, first of all, have a loudspeaker that is radiating audio in a very controlled fashion and controlling the directivity uh, of the audio uh, uh, emitted into the space. And then in addition to that, we want to provide not only the dynamic range that you need at the listening position, but also the ability to adapt to the space acoustically so that the the total immersive uh, sound image is created correctly. So one of the things you guys have worked on is just sort of adding those kind of uh, delay and calibration 
automated delay and calibration capabilities. Yes, and in, in addition to that, we've also added the capability for each of the loudspeakers to be individually compensated for the loading effects. Because uh, when, when you place the loudspeakers close to, for example, a ceiling, a wall, a corner, then uh, the audio is modified because you have this acoustical loading. And mm. uh, it's a very good idea to account for that. And uh, the, the best way of doing that is to actually listen to the loudspeaker at the listening location take a measurement, in other words, and mm -hmm. then go back and compensate the, the loudspeaker so that it's it's putting out the correct amount of audio at different frequencies so that all loudspeakers sound neutral, given their position in the room. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, interesting. So what about, you know, I guess, uh, Bernie, I want to bring you in here a little bit. Um, you know, we've talked about monitoring in the control room. Um, there are lots of other areas where we're doing con uh, confidence monitoring or we're doing monitoring for other people in the production. And as we get sort of to immersive formats or even looking forward to next generation audio formats, is that something that you have to you have to sort of allow for in future products or are planning for in future products? Absolutely, yeah, that's right. I think um, if you if you think of existing productions being done in five point one, um, we're still selling a large number of our monitoring units in um, which obviously only have the, the stereo speakers built in, but people are using them to check Dolby encoded signals. So there are still other positions within the production chain where you don't have the space or um, for that uh, dedicated house monitoring environment. So whilst the, the A1 will have that environment, um, there is still a need for tools, whether it's in existing of one format or beyond, the, the, the need doesn't really, there will be an encoded signal that you want to be able to code, check the integrity, um, and really drill down by listening to a down mic or by drilling down into the individual legs of that signal to check and you can't have a dedicated monitoring environment in each of those positions so that's where these monitor our monitoring units can come in uh, to allow you to to either use those inbuilt speakers or even headphones um, in a lot of these positions where you're in a noisy environment that can be a, a great benefit and that's a you know I, I think we'll talk a little bit about headphone virtualization but that's an interesting point is headphones maybe offer an opportunity to to virtualize um, a surround mix. But I guess then you also need to be able to see the individual legs of, say, a 514 and listen to the 514 core. And then it's still like listening to the fold down of the 514. I think I've always felt like if you've got your mix structured right, that the stereo is still a great way to check everything upstream of it. Aaron, are you nodding your head? Yeah, absolutely. I'm nodding because uh, I think I alluded to fold down compatibility. So I'm I'm always um, actively trying to compare the ED2 fold down to the Dolby E. So I'm looking for consistency in, in those because obviously with uh, ED2 Jock, we all know that the the height content the height content is still included in the um, in the stereo fold down, or yeah. albeit at lower levels. Um, that opens up a question or a, a sort of conversation for the content of the immersive objects themselves. You know, should they be included in the fold downs for the non for the non atmos side of um, so uh, what, customers? What height yeah. trim do you guys typically use? Uh, we go twelve. We go 12, 12 from the heights. Yeah into the rears, into the five, uh, six, six into the five one, and then another six or 12 into the stereo. So they're there at quite a low level in the stereo ultimately. But, you know, if, if you, if, if that, if that particular object is a, is a, is an important aspect to the mix in, in immersive, what I sort of put the question out there, how do people feel? Should it be, should that be included in the standard stereo mix? 
because until until we move on to AC4, which you might want to comment. Well, on this is the. I, I think this is a question, and certainly, uh, you know, I've talked to some of your colleagues a lot about that. Is I, I, I think there's a a good argument that the five one that the Atmos core and the legacy five one should be the same thing. So it works makes sense from a workflow, but also it means you're not creating two separate five ones. Someone who's hearing the Atmos in five one is going to hear the Atmos core with the heights in it. So I think the argument is to 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 put them to be able to have something come down from the heights and be a part of the the fronts and rears, um, but it's a compromise between being able to to push the heights for for effect, but but then you you know you lose them if you want to have those effects. And again, it's the sort of same thing we go through with five one to stereo is what's the you know what's the best compromise, but um, you know, that's something we've sort of talked about, you know, a lot. Um, and, and it's a great question. Um, and I, you know, I don't know, David, you've been kind of working, you know, you were working on that, but what, what about, and I, I want to get to a little bit more of what you've been doing lately, but what about this sort of like, what's the, the answer for the height trims from your perspective? I mean, depend, I mean, with the tr with the heights, it's it's part of your new soundscape. So, I mean, uh, it's whether we say we put some atmos up there, and then how much does that work, or how much does that affect the fold down? Um, but it's 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 really mixing within the whole sort of soundscape of the atmos of what it gives you. I think for mixers, it, it opens up another layer of creativity, doesn't it? And are we just putting atmosphere up there, or are we finding other uh, toys or other sounds that could go up there? That, fit down in the, in the fold down and, and when you look at the fold down especially what we're listening to and some stuff on headphones just for an example it's, it's it's actually creating a bold quite nice around sound so actually using it and embracing it um so it fits in of course you don't want it to be overwhelming and you don't want it to um uh, and you don't want to take away but it's i mean with the trims the, it depends how you're using it if it's just a bit of effects that's washing it out then yeah you're going to bring it down but if you're using the soundscape and there's stuff up there that's important that then you might not trim it quite as much or sort of move you're moving uh some things from from the normal surround plane moving them up to the heights and therefore you want them to come back and absolutely that's the, that's, than... that, that's the uh, that's the argument for trimming less yep. and um uh, and the trouble is then you can't just go you can't go crazy um well, on the heights I mean, the, the other thing with bringing it up uh some stuff up to the height as well is sometimes we we very center you know not necessarily center but we have at one position something and we're trying to force it out and it sometimes it could be barking or quite aggressive whereas if you use the wider soundscape it could be softer you can you can get the same level especially when it folds down but it, it, it's a softer approach yeah interesting so um David, you want you want to talk a little bit about what you've been doing with the sort of looking at single stream, looking at headphone virtualization. That's something that, thanks to Apple and other people and what's happening in music, there's been just a whole lot more activity in immersive than just the theatricals and and live and linear sports, and. It seems like that that's sort of spurred a lot of development, a lot of thought. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I, th I think we've had a boost. Uh, you know, we've had uh, from the music and the post where they have the environment and the time. Uh, I think we've had a boost. I think there's some, been some brilliant work in the field with what people have done with the football and the Olympics, as people spoke about before, about actually capturing the sound. But we've been looking at I think I think two key things for people is you know is for us and what we've been looking at was workflows in the broadcast, um, and 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 how to make a workflow pretty you know straightforward and also 
something that's been key to what we've been looking at is how it, how it sounds in the headphones, uh, which also in the middle of that was, can you do a one mix for all? So we've actually done a, been working on some content where we've actually we decided to actually mix straight to headphones via Atmos. And this is broadcast and we were treating it as if we were running a multi-track. So it's as live. So trying to replicate the broadcast environment. Um, we've, we, we, we stripped it right back and we decided let, let's, uh, let's bring in some toys. Let's not try and keep a conventional mix and make it work. Let, let's just take it all the way back and let's build from the ground upwards. And we actually found that we, uh, we mix purely in headphones using the Atmos and the soundscape. I, I get it that you also have metering that shows you slightly what's going on, so you can trust that as well. So you're not go, you're not flying completely blind. Uh, and then we didn't until we were happy with what we got, and we felt we had a bold, and it's obviously not completely immersive in headphones, but we had a bold kind of mix. Then we listened to it in the uh, in the room and the broadcast environment, and it, and it actually sounded good. We found working backwards in that way. So we found. We, we then tweaked it, had a compromise. So we found that we can actually mix and uh, do a one mix all with Atmos. That is effectively your stereo, your fold downs and what you're hearing in your headphones. The thing that I know is, is key is that is then making that into a live workflow. And that's something that we've been working on. And we found with monitoring, you know, I started, I was, I was always a 514 because my environment, I couldn't have anything more. I've then, since I've been in the Dolby dungeon, um, I've, I've, I've been had the luxury of having more. So I've particularly been in a 714. But the great thing, I think if you can get the Atmos, well, this is the opinion of what we're looking at. If you can get the Atmos mix right, then hopefully with everyone having Atmos in there, if it's a mobile device, a computer, a laptop, hopefully your TV sets, your, your set top boxes, it knows what the fold down should be. And hopefully the end user gets the benefit of what you've been doing in the soundscape there. So going back to what you're saying and talking about trims and monitoring, if you are using soundscape in a fuller way, you can, you can still suit all the environments. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so in terms of these workflows, um, the Larry, you're, um, you guys have kind of built some of these tools that, that make, uh, make the workflow a little bit smoother and just getting away from monitoring for a second in terms of the 5300, what you do with automatic up mixing and integrating sort of legacy content that's playing in or commercial over here that's playing in. Right. Um, <clears throat> you see, right. Talk about, yep. Talk about so, that. Yeah, we have um, our, it's called Upmax ISC, and this will upmix either stereo or stereo plus dialogue or 5.1 into a 5.1.4 um, <clears throat> uh, signal. And it has automatic detection in there. So it can detect if you're receiving a native 5.1.4 mix, say coming from a, from a venue, and then automatically switch in to pass through mode or into up mixing if it detects that, you know, an advertisement's coming in as 5.1. So that really helps to enable the workflow there of integrating um, legacy content in with native immersive content. Um, and that actually can, can work a standalone unit that can be inserted onto an audio console in low latency or with our LA5300, that can sit further down in towards the transmission chain uh, and, and in play out to, to accomplish that. And in, so, I guess, you know, in, in certainly in NBC production, it sort of happens in both places. Yeah. Right. So you have it one. It does. There you go. There's Aaron's cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and also, you know, with the, with our 5300, um, there is confidence monitoring built confidence decoding and monitoring built in there so that after you encode the signal as AC4, um, you can decode it and get the PCM out there so that you know, at least in, in that point in the chain, everything is good and happy, which is mm -hmm. a, another aspect of monitoring to, to keep in mind. And, and you've also kind of in the, well, at least in the MPEG-H encoder, you also have some rendering capabilities that facilitate 
monitoring and legacy. Right. Our, um, with a unit we have, it's called AMS, that actually can author and um, modify the control track information that goes um, with that immersive audio format. And so you can get an immersive audio output, a rendered 5.1, a rendered stereo output um, simultaneously, as well as giving you a control room monitoring output where you can listen to all these configurations uh, mm -hmm. in real time as, as you're mixing it. And, you know, this is a general, this is a subject we return to all the time, but I guess, you know, I, I'm curious, Aaron, about that sort of thing. And you mentioned it earlier about just the complexity of what you're, you know, what you're listening, having to listen to, because it's not just the main presentation. Um, is that becoming a, is that becoming a challenge? Um, it's I can... getting out of control of all the different things you have to listen to. And is it something that we need to look at leveraging AI to do or? Yeah, I think um, obviously everything is driven by the metadata and we trust the, the metadata that we use now. Um, but when you're talking about the concept of AI driving that, you know, the number of workflows and versions of mixes that personalization can bring, you know, is the, is the next challenge. Um, it's here now, it's around the corner. As soon as our clients realize that they can um, utilize the benefits and create more workflows with, with the enhanced metadata or AI personalization, mixes to viewers, you know, the sheer scale of what, what could be produced is, I think it's going to be too much for, for one person in, in, in the chair. Um, and the guy behind him is, is guaranteeing the room or, you know, guaranteeing the truck or it's, it's a set of workflows, which the technology is, it's going to be an advantage for us and for our clients and for um, production teams and broadcasters, but how we manage that um, is, is going to be a challenge. Um, because you're you're basically you you're still controlling that immersive mix, or your very your two or three or four versions of the current immersive mixes that we're already delivering. You know, if we talk about um, object-based stems. You know, we've got the ability to to define an object and push it through the system. Potentially, it could go go all the way through the system from point of source, define that object, and spit it back out at the viewer end without any human intervention, unless you talk about AI. Um, and I think that's quite a risk um, without it being monitored. I brought this up a few times to colleagues about the potential for that. And, you know, no broadcaster wants to be informed by their customer that a personalized version that the viewer has chosen based on what's been offered to them is, is uh, you know, is below the acceptable standard that's expected for whatever reason within there's degradation in that audio source or the content itself is, um, you know, is questionable. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's tricky. And it's sort of like, what are the other, you know, confidence monitoring points? And, you know, Bernie, when you think about next generation, you, you sort of see how you'll have to have be able to render different presentations or what, you know, what's the what challenge does that take for a, just a rack monitor or does that start to need to be the monitoring process needs to be automated? Oh, I think, yeah, I think that there's some good points there. I think the um, next generation audio, it's, it's much more than just the spatial, the additional height content. It's the, the personalization features that it offers. To me, that's what will really drive the type of, um, for, for people at home, having that uh, ability to uh, to change the dialogue level, potentially change languages, um, that that will be a key driver for it. As a producer of the content, though, just like Aaron's saying, you, you need to be able to check every part of what you're providing, and so there'll be um, if if it is an immersive production, there'll be an immersive bed of sound, but then you'll have your objects as well. So for 
for us as a monitoring unit, confidence monitoring unit provider, we need to look at being able to provide the tool so that you can check not only the, the individual elements of your bed and your object, but also that you can create those representative mixes that people will be listening to at home so that we it, you, you give the, um, the producers of the content. And again, like Aaron says, it'll probably need more than one engineer to really be able to go through the the number of different options that there might be and the, the variations in those to know that you're providing a consistent level of content at the output. Yeah. Now, well, how do you see these sort of challenges in terms of the facilities you're providing? And do you see, you know, do you see building trucks with AI-based mixers or AI-based submixers? No, what's um, your big picture view of this? Well, I mean, we tend to be client led. So if it was something a client um, requested, we would look at facilitating it. Um, certainly, we've not had any conversations along those lines at the moment. I mean, um, in the past, we've been involved in testing with the Salsa Sound guys and worked on some of their technologies. Um, you know, and it, it's interesting to see the possibilities out there, but. Um, you know, as a facility, um, it's not typically for us to make the decisions in, in which direction we're going to go. Um, generally, you know, particularly, uh, well, even with 5.1 and then into Atmos, we were, we were led by um, Sky's requirements, you know, what, what they wanted to deliver. So we then had a conversation with them and, and tailored our facilities to, you know, meet their needs, basically. We, we would tend very much to work on that basis. So, um, you know, and while... I say, you know, we didn't necessarily let Sky come and design the truck. We had to think about what they were hoping to achieve and, you know, presented the design and said, you know, how do you feel about this? Thankfully, you know, what we offered, they were happy with. So, um, but we always seek to, to move on. So when we built that last generation of trucks, when we did the change, we built, started building 4K trucks. We, um, Paul Fournier, who used to be here, he and I were discussing what we should do for monitoring. Everyone had always had the 1030 Genelec speaker as a reference, but that no longer was a professional product by this stage. So we were kind of looking for the alternatives and we actually had the luxury of going and doing a listening test and listening to all the different um, kind of offerings, uh, Genelec and others. And we actually settled on the 8351s as our main loudspeaker because we felt that they were head and shoulders above what um, we'd been using before, you know, the 1030s and, you know, the bigger variants thereof, um, particularly as Aaron has mentioned in terms of the, um, their image across the front certainly um, was a, a much better presentation of the image. So, you know, we will try and deliver the best technology that we think is available at that time, but for specific things. And, you know, we did have a demo of the, um, um, the unit that Larry was talking about, you know, we did try the up mixing, um, you know, Atmos thing, but production has kind of changed a little bit and the more presentation elements are, are less likely to be done on site of late. So, um, you know, we kind of didn't pursue that, but we always have an eye to new technologies and equally, if we see something, we'll mention to our clients like Sky, have you seen this product? Do you think that could work for you? And, and try and ar arrange trials and try and, you know, marry together manufacturers with our clients and try and find them solutions. But very much for, for something like AI, I think there's so many different choices out there. I don't really think it's for us to make the choice. I think we would have to be steered by our clients, say, we want to try this and, and we would work to, um, to deliver that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the salsa sound stuff and what they've done with auto you know auto pitch mixing already and then the sort of complete making multiple presentations that's in their you know current or the product they're working on now it's pretty interesting and it's interesting implications for broadcasters who do multiple languages and things like that um there's got to be a place for that uh, you mentioned selecting new systems for the trucks. I want to kind of return to a subject we had earlier and get Aki's view on this is what are, you know, what are the special challenges of these small spaces? And are there things, uh, Neville mentioned height speakers, are there still products that you're in development on that, that, uh, or that are, that are, uh, uh, 
holes in your product mix in terms of uh, low profile ceiling speaker or things like that. What are the, you know, what are the challenges specifically of these small spaces? Yeah, obviously um, uh, the space you have in terms of depth of the uh, monitor is a big issue, particularly in the in ceiling and uh, and in places like OB vans and these kind of smaller uh, monitoring rooms that are becoming increasingly popular these days. I mean, people are seem to be moving from larger venues to smaller rooms and uh, even to improvised spaces where you might really be crammed uh, to find uh, enough space for your for your gear. So so the the physical. Uh, space taken by the monitors is uh, of paramount importance for many people. Yet at the same time, people don't want to be compromising quality. And so if you think of quality, then obviously we want to have neutral frequency response, proper presentation of the sound stage. But at the same time, we want to have sufficient dynamic range. So to have these three things happen at the same time in a compromised facility, is a big that, that's a big ask. And this is something that we are taken very seriously and uh, the whole smart active monitoring range is basically addressing this this issue so so um, you may be helped by uh, bringing in some uh, uh, subwoofers to take care of the the low frequency radiation so that you can you can actually uh, uh, optimize better for, uh, for the space that you have available for monitors and uh, you are able to more more efficiently use the space you you can select physically smaller large speakers without compromising the maximum spl or the quality of audio so that that gives you additional flexibility that enables to deal with this kind of situation small uh, spaces ob vans these kind of challenging situations uh, and uh, so that, that, those are the kind of things that we have been introducing to help people who want to create the highest quality of monitoring, but they really have to, they have to fit the space that is available. Yeah. Well, that's a, a kind of question we always get into too a little bit is, do, you, do your main channels really need to be full range speakers and how much how much can you use base management to make a, yeah, a yeah. physically smaller speaker operate some, more efficiently? Some people take this uh, kind of in, in an orthodox kind of a theoretical way, and and they they may have opinions about you know what is the right frequency range for a given large speaker. If it's a main speaker, does it uh, how low in frequency does it have to go? In many cases, you know that that's a very good starting point. But in many cases, you have to just look at the situation. You have to look at what the room can do for you. So is the room capable of delivering uh, low frequencies uh, to your listening position and how it has to be done given the space that you're in? So there may be more than just the monitor and its capabilities to consider. So you have to find the way of uh, understanding how to select the monitors, their capabilities, and use them given the space. Uh, to get to a good situation. Now, saying that, I mean, many times people are concerned with the um, the fidelity of the reproduction of low frequencies. So, can you get the right impression of uh, if there is any any direction at low frequencies? You know, can can you understand this given your monitoring system and uh, modern approaches of building your monitoring systems give you a great deal of flexibility in terms of putting in also the reproduction of low frequencies, integrating that with your uh, higher frequencies and your main monitoring systems to enable you to, to receive this information if it's there in, in your recording. Interesting. Um, you know, uh, Ken uh, Hunnell actually asked a question, which I was going to kind of throw out to the group too, is uh, consumers are more and more listening on sound bars. And, uh, you know, David, you talked about the virtualized headphone experience, but uh, sound bars become a, a bigger and bigger thing in the home environment. 
And Aaron, is this something that you guys feel you need to, to check? Uh, and I think a lot of people talk about, well, the possibility, and anyone can take this, but the possibility of, oh, could we use a soundbar? Is it acceptable in some monitoring situations? Um, and, um, you know, I think there, there are reasons why it's not, I would think, but I, I'm curious what the sort of discussion around this, this is. Yeah, I actually had this as a question to put out there to you guys, actually, collectively. Um, you know, how many Atmos and surround mixers and production teams use sound bars as a comparison for how, immers how their immersive mix in discrete world fits into it when you uh, deliver it onto a, a sound bar? Um, because, um, you know, most of the customers most people in, at home, I think David said he had a discrete system at home, but I'm not sure how many of us have got the luxury of that. I wish I had, I've got a 5.1, but no, no plus four in my house um, and no soundbar at the moment. Um, you know, we use, um, we've got a, a viewing room at Sky uh, where we can um, view content from um, from a SkyQ box. So I suppose it's the closest thing to to what's gone to air. It, has, it actually has, it's a recording of a, one of our channels so we can play that back and recreate it in a, or play it back into a um into a soundbar um and um uh, it's interesting it can be you know you can make some really interesting comparisons with colleagues across different content you know it's, it's a good exercise internally for us to be consistent across all our platforms but also particularly about what i do in my specific craft is did i get the mix right did i ever cook it did i undercook it what sounds good in discrete or not quite enough in discrete sounds okay or quite good in a soundbar, you know, so that that's a question really is, is there, is there a common approach amongst the loudspeaker manufacturers when they design the loud, the, uh, the Atmos soundbars, you know, how, how, how much do they drift? And, you know, they're, they're obviously a, there's a competition, but is there a common ground where they, they embellish and use the reflections of the room and the technology of the sound bars and all the various forms that are available to customers. Um, where, where's that common ground? Because that's a really good sort of platform for where our content's actually going to if it's not an immersive headphone um, platforms. It's, it's gonna be on a sound bar, isn't it? I think that's the most realistic environment people are watching and listening to stuff. And I have to say, I've been quite impressed when I've gone into my local PC world or Curry's and listened. It's not been recent, but probably a year or so ago. And um, I was pretty impressed then. And the, the prices were a bit high, but um, the immersive sound bars were, were pretty cool. So um, well, there I are some amazing sound yeah. bars up there. The Sennheiser sound bar is phenomenal, you know, but it's, I don't know what, 1800 pounds or something. I don't know. It's, it's David, what do you think? Well, it's, it's always going to be, you know, it's always going to be, you, you want to bear in mind what, you know, your the, the final end person is listening to and what they want to listen to and how they're listening to. I mean, could, could we say, you know, a soundbar listening to it in our room every now and again could be the modern aura tone or something, you know, as a reference point, you know, yeah. so to speak. Um, or, and I think we're also going to, you know, we're talking about uh, productions, which, we, we've got the ability to have the full size trucks, uh, the, the full the full size uh, Sky Studios. Um, but I mean, there's going to be the other end of the scale where there's the smaller productions, but there's still, you're still going to want to possibly have Atmos or to be able to reach a certain level with it. You know, do we find that people could be in, in environments where where they don't have a full size truck or whatever, but they still need to listen to something in Atmos. And if you don't have an Atmos rig, what's the next best solution? So could a soundbar be a solution for this? You know, and then you could also listen to your Atmos fold down headphones and et cetera. But there's, there's going to be a level we're not all going to always going to be able to have the full scale and all the toys, I would have said. Yeah. And I would also expect that a lot of uh, executives may end up with sound bars in their offices to check what's going out to air as well yeah yeah interesting. what i find uh, challenging with this question is basically that uh, there are different kinds of sound bar designs on the market and they they significantly affect uh, the impression you get from your 
Atmos Mix or your, your immersive mix. And uh, that uh, is somehow a challenge, uh, particularly if one considers using soundbar as the main monitoring device when, when, you are, when you're actually mixing. Doesn't it come well, to... it did do people ask you, Aki, to make a to make a professional soundbar? Is this subject? I mean, it, it, to, to, today it's increasingly coming up, uh, <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a it's a hard uh, call because basically, then uh, when you start reproducing from a soundbar, then you are making some kind of compromise and decision about how you're going to create audio in the space and uh, if you if you want to do something like reflect off the ceiling or, or whatever then uh, it will have some effect on what you experience and uh, it's a uh, it can be a very complex effect and uh, it's it's going to be challenging to trust what you're hearing entirely isn't, yeah. isn't there a point uh, roger you, you you looked at ai and i think we all agree AI is going to be really important because it, it, it can, as algorithms get better, it can, it can, it can really make things more perfect than they would be in the natural environment. Um, but from a consumer's point of view, they can get as close as they can in the best way with say, if a sound bar is, has the ability to fire off in the room and make itself the best it can be in the room. And then also if it is say talking to the set top box or the device and the Atmos uh, knows what, what sound bar it is, you know, and how it perceives that the down mix or it, or how it should be delivered to the speakers. So if you can manipulate your room to be the best it can be for that person and you can tell it the best fold down or the you know, best algorithm for it, then you are giving your consumer the closest and the best you can. Well, the soundbar certainly guarantees your LCR, if nothing else. And I think that's a, that's a win. You know, often people are not hearing dialogue because their center speaker has become unplugged or it's, you know, fallen off the shelf or whatever. I don't know. It's a, just an interesting question. Do most soundbars implement, just implement two-channel heights, though, David? They fold the heights together or? I've got, right. to, I've got to be honest. I don't know how how it folds exactly the heights for I different ones. I think the well. soundbar, lot like soundbar decoders are really only two heights, but I don't know. Uh, it, it may be two heights, but it tries to fire it in different directions. I would have thought it would find it hard to fire off four heights and make. Yeah, that work. I, I think they're mostly, but anyway, they're awesome. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a big question. You know, these monitoring environments, though, we have kind of in post-production, we're very precious or we used to be very precious about um, monitoring for Atmos. Um, and now I think in, in live and linear, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Um, and is there, a, is there a point where live and linear is starting to meet post-production in terms of simplified workflows. If I'm doing a reality show or if I'm doing a, uh, doing some other reality-based television or a music special or whatever, but I'm not necessarily dealing with discrete objects. How are those kind of workflows getting simpler? Uh, I can contribute certainly on, on reality. We produce quite a bit of reality content um, uh, through our company. Uh, well, I should say we facilitate it. We don't produce the content. We allow um, our clients to produce the content. But yeah, traditionally they're they're only in stereo. Um, but again, that comes down to what the um, what the uh, client is requesting us to deliver it in. Of course, you know we could deliver them in more sophisticated formats, but it's often down to um to throw it back to post-production workflows for some of these events um you know with the time scales and the turnaround they don't have the post-production time to um deliver a sophisticated audio mix um you know uh, aside from the kind of specifications for certain broadcasters um that vary you know as we know there's disparate specifications between the uk broadcasters you know, um, BBC, ITV, Channel 4 all have kind of different delivery formats. So there go my lights again. So, um, yeah, it's again, it, it's a bit of a client led thing, but where particularly with live events, I mean, obviously Sky 
probably kind of differ and some of the high end events, you know, sky events and Olympics events differ from their real time delivery. A lot of people would prefer to only deliver in stereo to reduce the complexity and, and the margins for error, obviously. Um, and particularly with big light entertainment shows, that's obviously often easier to just deliver in stereo because um, it simplifies the workflow and the turnaround time. So, um, you know, obviously live events can be more challenging and certain people will push harder because they consider it more important. But certainly um, reality, uh, I don't think we've had any requests yet to deliver any kind of our reality projects in Atmos. So. Huh. Or, or even 5.1. I mean, that's interesting yeah. because it's just sort of 5.1 is almost standard for, you know, for everything here and even you know, even news programs, you know, the, they're talking heads, you put them in the center channel, the, the bumper music is in 5.1 and you're, you're done. I don't know. It's, I mean, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question as it relates to monitoring, but it's just an interesting question. Workflow is like sort of jumping back and forth seems like adds more turbulence and, and complexity. Is it that much harder, you know, just talk about live and linear stuff. And well, I even might pick on Ian here in a minute, seeing as how he's on the screen. I, you know, is it that much harder now in terms of monitoring, in terms of mixing? Is it, is it that much more workload? Um, Aaron or uh, to, to do, to do, at most mixing now. Do you want Ian to jump in or shall I? No, yeah. Well, I was trying to wake Ian up. I didn't know whether he's... there he is. <laughs> hey, a... I, I just as, said as a up. fellow gray beard. <laughs> I'd shave mine off. <laughs> uh, there you go. Yeah, we well, are here. We just we'll pick on well, you first. Well, I think I mean when we went at Moss with the football, um, because we're using the sound field and the way we originated the heights and everything, it, it didn't actually impinge that much on the workflow, did it, Aaron, in that respect? It, you know, it, it, it came in fairly seamless, didn't it, because of the way we were producing the football at that time. Um, what worries me, I think, in the future is when we start using lots of objects. Um, if you say, you know, say you've got four different um, commentaries going in, French, Italian, or whatever, it's how you're going to monitor that. And I think you do come back, we're going to have to look at AI, because I don't see how the guarantee engineer or anybody can, can check what's happening. I mean, I've just come off of obviously doing quality control on the on the Euros uh, back in June. And just like the number of fees are just trying to work out what's happening. You, you can have a feed go down or even go out of time, and you don't realise for like three minutes, because there's just so much going on. And I think... AI is going to have to come into that listening to object. What is it, 16 objects? As soon as you go into that, otherwise you're on the end user, you know, that half an hour after the faults happened that you've lost your commentary, finally getting through to the truck and saying, did you realise that object number 15 has gone down? Um, so you are going to need a much more proactive, I think, object monitoring um, in the system somehow. Yeah, that's a fair point because, you know, um, we, we joke about kind of QC by Twitter, but, you know, it, it has happened quite a bit where mm. all of a sudden Twitter lights up with something going on. You realize that there's something happening downstream of you. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that often you haven't caught. So um, because and, and, and increasingly, even on something relatively straightforward, like a football match, uh, doubly so now that there's HDR as well as SDR, the actual physical number of circuits leaving the truck while there might only be one or two audio mixes, there's different iterations of it, leaving for SDR and HDR that all have to be co-timed to match the pictures. Um, you know, and there's so many different formats. You can't monitor all of them at, at once. You know, I mean, while yes, when they're often originating from, originating from the same place, from the same bus outputs on the console, that helps. But, you know, you, you physically cannot monitor that many outputs at once. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, so so maybe there is a role for AI here in 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 monitoring and and maybe in mixing. If we're mixing all these feeds, and the AI is checking them as it goes, because you're making a, a different fan experience, even you know, and and not just necessarily a commentary in another language. But well, what if it's a what if it's a um, you know different crowd? You know, it's like 
I mean, you guys, Aaron, you've talked about doing this stuff in the future. Sky's talked about doing this stuff in the future, and it's all very interesting, but it's going to be hard to know what all those different feeds are like. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, in practical terms, you know, just just remember when we're already kind of, we're working at a fairly high, you know, in terms of workload and concentration levels, they're kind of maximized in the current Atmos live side, um, you know, appreciate this production, post-production elements. And, you know, there, there's the opportunity to embellish the, the Atmos mix, like Neville's saying, a lot of clients will produce the stuff or do it live in stereo. If then, if it goes to an edit, they'll maybe re push it back out into a surround mix through the edit process. But, in my 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 sort of my my area of of work is it's it's doing it right live you get one chance to get it right and and also the client the producer the producer the director they're not listening to your atmos mix they're listening to stereo in the gallery so when they're asking for more crowd or less crowd you know which which version am i currently on at that point when there's a query query with a version of a mix with a certain picture that's leaving the, the, the truck or the, the gallery, you know, there's, there's still really practical, practical challenges that we have to manage now um, and, and still maximize the immersive um, mix outputs. Um, and like Ian said, the Southfield, um, we've, that we, 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 we stuck with that, it's tried and tested sort of surround microphone. I know people have different views on uh, more discrete sound sources um to create the atmos mix um and we are looking at always looking at ways to sort of freshen things up and and add and enhance that sound field um but that's the tried and tested sort of um surround mic where we start from but you know i just think um it's just going to open up a lot more um challenges for um for ensuring that those 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 mixes and third party takers and the utilization of 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 what the 16 will give us and pushing out to different platforms and takers which we can already currently do but um as that expands we're going to need ai just like the guys have said you know to there's going to have to be some some concepts and ideas and and solutions really to to aid that because um we can't really do it in the, in 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 the, in, in the center of the room in the chair at the moment it's not really possible well and the tools you know thanks to moore's law the tools for that become you know become more and more powerful with and and immediate and and verifying language just li listening to something and having the ai decide yeah that's french or whoops that's not french you know just just going to be interesting and what is how does uh, you know how does ip affect all this uh in terms of building this infrastructure but also in terms of the complexity of monitoring and you, know, you guys talk about 16 signals and what what about when it's 32 or 64 signals or infinite number of signals what's the i guess kind of go around a little bit and maybe starting with you bernie is like what about ip in your you know your products and you've had some uh ip solutions for a while but when we look at 2110 solutions and you know what's the what are the challenges yeah. there? Um, I, I think that when, it, well, with in, in terms of Atmos delivery, obviously you just need to get the you need to get the content across your infrastructure, and and any of the methods out there can be used. It doesn't need to be IP, but it it, it could be IP. Um, when people are designing IP solutions, I think the the key the key area where there are differences between implementations is the control. So how the um, how the in this case how the audio is being routed around the network and there are um, there are a number of control systems obviously TSL have a control solution as well and um, that again for us having that control experience has been really helpful with our IP product so we have we have end endpoint products and we also have the a control system and it's allowed us to we've been able to learn in both camps as we've gone through which has been helpful but um i think there's been a lot of learning done in the ip world over the last few years and there are mature products there are good solutions out there and it's a perfectly viable way of 
creating and it, for a lot of people it would be their default starting point for new facilities or new trucks hmm. and what are the you know kind of what are the with the additional flexibility as we kind of look at 2110 where audio streams are not embedded what are the challenges there and are we just replicating well let's just have them let's just configure this so that they're they're limited to look more like SDI. Now, this is your area and to a certain extent. Uh, I, this is I your nightmare, that one coming your headache. Way. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, I think Bernie makes a very good point. It, it's about getting your product out. And actually, the medium, be it 2110, embedded, it, it, it's just a transport stream. And, and basically, in any kind of system design these days, effectively, you're looking at, um, at building your transport streams, and then it's just how you interact with your transport stream. So, you know, um, Bernie's products, the monitoring products, be it, you know, the embedding um, Adobe eStream off an SDI or, you know, picking up a 2110 stream. At the end of the day, um, I, I kind of go back to say that, you know, um, a microphone and a speaker are still analog at the end of the day at the point of delivery or the point of capture so everything in between is just a means to get from one to the other so you can have any um any means of um kind of transport in the middle and they can make your life a lot easier certainly in terms of infrastructure it can potentially be um physically far less elaborate in a 2110 environment but the technical complexity shoots up so it's you know it's ease of installation versus ease of operation, I guess. But yeah, it's like I say, I, I would totally subscribe to Bernie's point that it's just the means of getting your signals around uh, and you can use any means you feel necessary so long as you know your content is right. And I think that that is key. And, and I think the transport is almost secondary to that. You know, but obviously when it's working, when it's not working, well, that's a different conversation, but. Well, the speaker's analog, the microphone's analog. Um the speakers still often are are not the uh, io is not necessarily digital um is that changing well if i may i mean uh digital audio obviously has been in use for quite a long time directly into the monitor so so that in that sense uh, audio has been digital for monitoring for quite a long time and uh, i think people mostly consider digital uh, connectivity to monitors to to be more reliable have potentially better performance uh, uh, for monitoring audio or for delivering audio to monitors and uh, i think basically what ip audio over ip is kind of adding to that is um, flexibility um I mean, uh, I think it, this this was a nice statement that uh, you are contrasting ease of installation to ease of operation. So this is this is what we are talking about. Uh, so um, single cable connectivity enables you potentially to tap any channel of audio into any one of your monitors. That's a great potential flexibility that is is brought by um, IP connectivity and. Uh, I think this is where the world seems to be moving towards because simply it gives you so much more potential of using your facility and so much more flexibility in operating what you have that uh, I think people are going to want to see this become a reality in their life. So um, this means that uh, the systems to operate and control and manage these kind of systems have to kind of step up to meet the, the call here. Yeah, so you have to kind of create virtualized monitor controllers, and 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 the um, the compensation and whatnot that you've talked about has to be embodied in a in a control system, a virtualized control system. Yeah, in fact, uh, what Genelec has is already kind of oh. going going there because we have we have this control network that basically connects to all the monitors enables you to see all the monitors to uh, uh, control all the monitors as a system so we we kind of already have that kind of control at the moment uh, it is not running on ip networking uh, but it basically is providing the kind of facility that you would want to see in your monitoring space 
that that you you can control or your full system through a single point in the room yeah so so they're they're connected by a a network that's just used for control and yes. the and the audio io is but that it it is separate at the moment so so we we can also take and accept uh, audio over ip so that uh, that possibility is available in some products some people like the fact that you have a separate physical network for controlling things i think this may be changing over time when people uh, grow in confidence in in how much to what extent you can mix different types of traffic over ip network without running into problems in operating your facility and this obviously is something that that we want to keep on developing for the future well and this sort of stuff is pretty standard if we look at uh, sound you know sound reinforcement installed sound i guess i should say where it's all ip now and yes and there are mul multiple protocols running on the ip network control protocols as well as transport roger on the on the ip side well there's a couple of things i would uh, say well on the ip side something i found is 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 you can you get low latency now so something that you can do is you can implement other tools within your mix because with the low latency i guess so you you've mentioned salsa so if you want to integrate salsa into your sound of what you're doing you know if it's connected via you know over ip and it is low latency then you're getting into the mix without causing problems there's other tools that, and tricks and you know you know things we can have to add a little sparkle to it you know or, or sound reinforcement um which which is open now which helps within the atmos as well and some of this as you said going back to the workflow as 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 people integrate bits more and more so say our main tool is the is the mixing desk as manufacturers are constantly integrating some of these tools we're trying to use and some of these bits then the workflow becomes easier as well yeah well the ip makes it makes it easier to do stuff like send something manage a plug-in or have a yeah. plug-in engine i mean um, i mean as for it opens the door for multiple inputs i guess we we, we aaron and uh ian you'll know you know we just have to manage the balance between what we want and what we need and i guess over time with more atmos bits that we do and things like that you know what you need I guess we we'll always want more though, won't we? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is it, is it is it worthwhile to mention just the fact that with IP you you get more and more of this dissociation of the control surface from the signal processing, and uh, that that really I mean things are becoming much more flexible in that in that area. Yeah, well, and that's just sort of like, and even the story of the last eighteen months or so has been a lot about virtualization, right? is we're sort of separating and ip has helped that we're 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 separating uh the production infrastructure we're spreading it out geographically we're doing things in multiple places at once and um and and that's just going to become a bigger issue and the mix mixer core doesn't necessarily be, need to be here or there or anywhere it can be in the cloud or doesn't matter you know, and we have people dialing into mix cores remotely. We have people running mix cores in the cloud. We have a bunch of signals coming in from the venue over IP and then mixing them in the gallery. So it's sort of like all of the above. You know. um, Larry, you're a techn technology guy. Any, any more to say about IP from your pr perspective as it relates to the subject? I think it's uh, been pretty well covered here. Um, you know, uh, uh, but everybody's made great points, and and um, I really like Neville's point of ease of integration versus ease of ease of operation. Um, you know, one one thing certainly about IP is that it makes it a lot easier to bring more signals in and out of a unit than populating you know panels of of SDI and AES connections. Um, so the virtualization and um, and even just other you know standalone hardware units, it, it makes it a lot easier to get denser and denser products that can do more for you in, in a single unit. 
And do people ask, Larry, do they ask about, and just coming on the cloud thing for a second, do they ask about uh, implementing your products in the cloud? Is that something Ab that comes up? Absolutely. Um, you know, you mentioned mixers in the cloud. You know, we have a, a cloud-based mixer. Um, we, we now have intercom in the cloud. Well, that's true. Well. Yeah, your, your colleagues there at the uh, Infinity Intercom and... Yeah. And I guess, yeah, Telos uh, makes some cloud-based mixing solutions for smaller mixers. And I guess actually ASG is using those for Google and other people for some of the mm -hmm. corporate. Yeah, and, and on the intercom side, um, uh, we've partnered with Grass Valley. So that's in their AMP system now. Yeah, our the Infinity. Infinity. Intercom. Yeah, which I think uh, Martin Deister has showed all of us at one time or another uh, it's pretty pretty slick yeah you know and that's the thing is like intercom is like as this production gets more and more virtualized the comms problems just get get harder and harder and and you have now talent and other people on on some kind of a internet based connectivity um, and IP connection to the truck. And, and I think that next generation intercom solutions like Telos is are probably going to be more and more important. You know, I think so. Well, Absolutely. yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, any further? Uh, what Neville, what do you Laughing. I was just going to say latency come be, uh, and monitoring become critical there, but especially latency. Um, but that's something we're all well aware of. Yeah, but there's also latency has synchronicity implications, but there's, you know, don't, do we confuse, do we confuse sort of latent, latency and synchronicity? I mean, if we have a remote if we're bringing signals in as well, Aaron, you guys were mixing what uh, volleyball or something for the Olympics for NBC, right? And I, and that has some huge latencies, but listening to volleyball, I think you mostly did it synchronously as I, far as I could tell. Yeah, uh, sorry, carry on, Roger. No, I was just asking you about, tell, remind me what you guys were doing. You were doing a couple of sports, well, forgive me, I'll have to give you a fairly generalized answer. That was sadly Emma who can't join us. She was involved on the, at the NBA basketball sale, the NBC basketball. So, um, yeah, lots of cloud based um, concepts and solutions um, have been utilized across that. Um, so, I can't really, um, I can only. But you guys, the point is, is you're got, you guys were taking in a feed from Tokyo, and Emma and I guess other people were, were mixing it. The talent was in Stanford, Connecticut, <laughs> and it all sounded sounded just fine to me. <laughs> you, you, you proved the point to where it looked natural, and they they obviously took took some time doing a a, a Eurovision song cost, contest style fact check. I would have thought I would have insisted on that if I was <laughs> if I was anywhere close to that job. I would have said that's that's just put a day aside just to do a. A two-way check, please, rather than 30, a 30 second commercial break, which I usually get a chance to check it in um, in the current remote production scenario for football. So latency is a bit of a thing for that. But um we uh I think that actually it kind of raises a little side 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 thing anyway, where where the remote remote production concept puts a little bit more pressure back on the guys on on site, you know, Neville's guarantees and the guys actually on the remote truck, although albeit it's a smaller truck real estate wise we're maximizing those that truck we're really pushing pushing it we're expecting it to just create a lot of inputs and outputs and like latencies handled by 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 nature of the the rp1 which we use for the carrot console so we yeah again i was i i had uh, uh suspicions about it when we first were told this is the way we're going to work but the latency is sort of taken care of with that setup um but it does put 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 a lot of pressure back on the hub truck for sure and that's a very very real current challenge that 
isn't going to go away anytime soon the way we work in terms of what we expect the hub truck to to keep across in terms of well, talent. And that, a, a lot of that is around monitoring and the talent monitoring and, and comms i would think you know that yeah suddenly neville yeah yeah no absolutely because you know where previously on a on a large sky match we would have had two audio guarantees plus two sound supervisors to produce all those feeds all of a sudden the supervisors have all left site and you're left with a lowly guarantee in the truck who is now doing the work of two guarantees so you know one looking after previously you'd have one looking after the talent and one looking after the match coverage side of things and now you've got to look after both so um you know and serve two directors at the same time um, with their needs so yeah it, it's um it can be challenging, uh, certainly making sure that everyone is happy. Um, thankfully, because our trucks don't just tend to work on that contract during the season, once you kind of get a, get it roughly in shape, the tweaks become less. It's, um, you know, so once you get the first few matches of the season out of the way, everything kind of settles down and beds down and, and gets into a rhythm. But they can still be pretty demanding, just making sure that everyone's happy because different talent have different expectations. And, and different thresholds of annoyance, shall we say, diplomatically. So, um, you know, someone will be more tolerant than others as as to um, what they're hearing in their ears. But, you no, know, I've it, never heard it, of the talent being difficult. To, no, I know. I'm familiar with I know. that. Uh, but that's not to say that any of Sky's talent are, by and large, they're, they're, they're very accommodating. And, you know, there's a lot going on in their ears. I don't know sometimes how they work yeah. with it. But, you know, yeah, it's, but the key is monitoring and, you know, to kind of build on, on Aki's point, yes, um, I understand the concept of um, feeding loudspeakers perhaps in um, digitally, but for us in our OB environment, if I've got a problem and I need to put in another speaker, you know, uh, for me, certainly all, all the monitoring in our trucks is all, all fed in analog because it's much quicker and easier to find the replacement if something goes wrong on site or you can listen and jack in and hear what's going on um, without any kind of conversion. So without in terms of flexibility, charge. yeah, but it, but it's horses for courses in a, in a studio environment that, you know, a nice purpose-built studio gallery environment, that's a different conversation, but in an OB, you know, it's kind of got to be rough and ready and easily replaceable with something, you know, that can equally do the job and, and it might not always what you'd be expected to be seeing in a truck, but it's whatever you can find on that day to make it work sometimes. So, you know, and I guess that was the point I was driving at with, with IP. Yes, it solves a lot of challenges, but some things um, uh, in, in the heat of battle, you know, sometimes analog is still better, dare I say. So, um, but it depends absolutely what you're doing. So, um, you know, you have to take a view on that. Well, what we know we're going to be doing is dealing with more and more complexity as we go on. Um, uh, everybody, this is this is Aki, Aaron, David, Bernie, Nev, and Ian. Thanks for joining us. This is <laughs> this has been uh, this has been just really interesting, and I, I you know hope we'll get to continue this this conversation. Um, Heather, are you there? Yeah. Brilliant conversation. Really, really good. All the stuff about soundbars and how the uh, consumer actually gets to listen to all this stuff as well. That's that's interesting. Yeah, well, and I'm going to correct myself is that some of the soundbar systems, particularly those with rear satellite speakers, and I think even Nakamichi makes a 714 with two satellite speakers, they have re up firing speakers. There are examples of soundbars that are almost not soundbars, you know. Uh, so... And but then the question is, well, how good do you want the sound bar to be? So I'll, it's a discussion for another day. Yeah. On the, yeah. On the sound bar, quickly, just to note, I've been reliably informed that a general sound bar is is a is a is a five one two. So right. Just yeah. to clarify. The typical um sound bar is five one two decoder. Yeah. But there you go. Yeah, well, this um, is a topic for another day, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, th thank you to everyone, um, to our lovely sponsors that make this all possible, uh, Telos Alliance and TSL Products and Genelec um, and Dolby, you know, talking about all the stuff that you guys do all the time. It's really, really interesting. And thanks to everyone that, that's come along and 
I, I know you guys love this stuff because you stay to the bitter end, which is fantastic. Um, all I've got to say is um, thank you to Roger and um, we'll see you again at our next event. So keep an eye out for, for mailers and information about that. Yeah, it um, sounds like we need to do uh, do one of these on AI and you know, yeah. sort of check up on what's happening. It's, uh, it's just interesting. Yes, re definitely. related topic. Yeah, so. I've been I've been scribbling notes, so I'll be uh, harassing some of our speakers. <laughs> for what do you think about this? Answer this question. Write this for me. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, All right. It's been great to get together with everyone. So, we'll see you again soon.